video restart okay i was just thinking of my explanation i realized it doesn't make a lot of sense let's make a better one so creatinine is made by the muscles and then it's basically it secreted into the blood the bloodstream okay so the bloodstream going everywhere it makes the heart inferior superior inferior aorta etc so all of the creatinine from our muscles end up within our bloodstream okay? and this creatinine is then excreted by the kidneys so logically if our kidneys stop working this guy's a this guy is a very very small waist and he's got a big pair of pants i don't know that that that, that chat guy does things like anyways so Okay, so we're following you. So creatinine in the blood excreted by the kidneys. So if our bodies can't excrete creatinine, the logical assumption that we make when we calculate the creatinine clearance, which is also the EGFR, same thing, just different formulas, the logical conclusion that we make is that we're saying, because our bodies can't get rid of the creatinine, that's why it's building up in the blood, it must mean that for some reason our kidneys are struggling or our kidneys are impaired somewhat. So, if the creatinine starts building up in the blood, it means that either the kidneys aren't working and we aren't excreting as much creatinine as normally, or for some, reasons, for some reason our muscle is making more. So, the muscle is starting to make more creatinine all of a sudden. Um, there's only one condition, but you'd never have to know about it, so it doesn't matter. So, most likely is the kidneys. All right. I hope that makes a little bit more sense. So this is what we use to calculate our, creatinine, our kidney function. Our kidney function is basically just a measurement of how fast we can clear creatinine. If we can't clear creatinine out of our system, it means that our kidneys aren't working. Okay, and then all of this, all of the processes happening here is basically defined in this formula. So 140 minus age times weight over SCR. And what is SCR as well? It's creatinine measured in micromoles per liter. Okay. This is the most important formula um, in South Africa. If you go to America or Europe or Australia or wherever, it'll be different. The population will be different. The way they make creatinine will be different. And also, do you think this formula will apply to everyone? It simply can't apply to everyone. Let's say this guy was muscular. This formula applies to him. Perfect. But let's say we get a person who's muscle wasted, who's very malnourished. He doesn't actually have a lot of muscle. So if you don't have a lot of muscle, how will you produce creatinine? You will produce much less creatinine. So it will look like your body is clearing creatinine very fast and effectively. But in reality, you're just not making as much. And we're trying to explain what's happening in your body with this formula but you are actually very abnormal and this formula for a normal person or a population average doesn't apply to you. So that's why in people who are muscle wasted, you have to be very, very, very careful in using the creatinine clearance. Okay, so you guys were supposed to use this formula. If you use the internet, you would have gotten the American formula, which will have a 72 year and this will be in milligrams per deciliter or something like that. I don't really know because I don't really care what the Americans do. So, but that was a mistake. It would have been a mistake. You should have used the formulas that we'd be using in class that I showed you in class. So, if you calculate the creatinine here, uh, a lot of you got 140. So, where did you go wrong? Well, you used the old creatinine from February. Remember that if you read the guidelines, we say that you have to first look at creatinine at baseline before you start off of a well, baseline that was a sip of coffee it's all baseline so why do we do this so we know where the kidneys are at so if you calculated it with that um, this measurement of how much was it 68 you would have gotten something over the 130 moles a minute um, the normal is 90 to 120 about so do you think 130 mils a minute is bad or good? It's actually amazing. If your kidney clearance is, or if your GFR is 130 mils a minute, it means you have almost augmented renal function, which uh, nothing bad can really, or there's not nothing, anything bad about it. Because then it means a drug, a drug that is cleared via renal function can't accumulate. If it can't accumulate, it can't 
make toxicity. So it actually is a good thing in the north of this case if this was the case. But it was not the case. If you used, so this is what you had initially, but if you use the formula, um, if you use the right creatinine, which is the one that was taken now when the patient was admitted, you would have gotten, remember the 101 over here, um, and look at the date. So the date is the one closer to today. Well, today is the day, admit, day of admission. If you use that, you would have went from 140 about, or 130, can't remember what he calculated, to about 96 or 98, somewhere around there. Um, of course, I also didn't uh, uh, deduct marks for being slightly off, because remember, this is an estimation of renal function. It's not a perfect value. So, you, there's a big difference between these two. Um, if you think about it, that's more or less a 30-something 30, 30 percent drop. So, if your kidney clearance has from baseline declined 30 percent, would you be concerned? Well, not necessarily, but I would have liked it if you at least brought it up. But I really don't expect it from you guys. So, the trend is, at our baseline we had a 68 micromoles per liter. And now, all of a sudden, we have a 101. So we had a decline of about 30% in GFR. So creatinine went up. That means that our body is not able to excrete as much creatinine. And because this went up, our creatinine clearance automatically went down. And that's the same thing as your eGFR. So it went down, meaning that something is happening to our kidneys. What's happening to our kidneys? And this is what is important. So we did it at baseline to see if a person is maybe getting some renal dysfunction because of the off of it. And in this case, it might have been the case. It might have been the case. It might also have been something else he was using outside. We're not really sure. But what would be best? To err on the side of caution or just to say that it doesn't matter? To err on the side of caution. So in your DRPs, if you mentioned that um, the creatinine was a problem for you and you wanted to switch to a bakover, you would have been right. If you didn't say that and you said the off of it is fine, you would also have been right, because according to the guidelines you guys are following, uh, serum creatinine of, I think it was, no, you need to have a creatinine clearance of less than 50 before we really start being concerned. So either way, it would have been fine for me as long as your justification had that logic in it. If you didn't have that logic in your justification, um, no. Anything in this form, you must be, you must be able to judge, justify it. Okay, so that was the first point I wanted to make, just off the bat. Okay, but now let's look at everything holistically. So 28 years old, 85 kilograms, BMI 26 is actually a kind of good weight. Um, Kilotin we clearance we just calculated. He con he's complaining of swollen breasts, so that is gynecomastia. Well, not yet, but the diagnosis is gynecomastia. Uh, I just put this, he's becoming a woman in for fun. No one laughed, so everyone was probably too stressed. Uh, something from a sore throat it says there's something white, some white stuff at the back of his throat. So already you must have alarms going off. Uh, and he's also complaining about feeling constipated. And this was another trap I made for you guys. So uh, we have that he was started on the north of the and epivirens. So we already, already now you have to know what is the baseline test that we should have done. CD4, viral load, creatinine, full blood count. Those are four things that we needed because. We do it at the start and then we monitor it later to see that is it going well with this patient on this therapy or is this therapy maybe an issue for him. That's why we do it. Okay, so we didn't have these. Um, if you said in your DRPs that um, you would want to do a full blood count because you're concerned about um, possible anemia or anything of the sort, I would have been very happy with you. So, that was the first step. Now we're seeing here, it's RBD positive on ARV since February, CD4 of 51, and this was now at the baseline when he started on the ARVs, same creatine of 68. Another important thing to mention is that the CD4 count is the only thing that we really need according to the guidelines to monitor a patient, but um, we'll see what happens next. As far as my mind goes, the viral load does tell you or does confirm what's going on with the CD4 count. So I, I really do like having a valid and a CD4 count, but it's not a, not a necessity. Okay, so here we can see, previous T, no previous TB, but he was admitted for cryptococcal meningitis. So he had cryptococcal meningitis as well. Does it make sense? Yes, but look at this very low CD4 count of 31. So it makes sense. And now, 
you now you have to have, have to remember it as something else which are in the guidelines for opportunistic infection treatment and prophylaxis uh, oh you're not seeing it prophylaxis all right so keep keep everything i mentioning now keep it in mind as we go to the plan um a lot of fluff a lot of fluff so here you can see he doesn't have tb negative he doesn't have cryptococcus pneumonia cryptococcal meningitis at this moment the india ink is a test used to test to see if we have um acid fast bacilli which is tb so these two are basically the same thing this is just much much more reliable uh, and then we have the cd4 count so with the cd4 count you can see the person actually increased now another thing that i kind of caught you guys with is this codeine over here substance history of sub substance use we've got codeine there okay that's very important um, I did mention codeine in another place. I'm just going to double check quickly. Uh, did I mention another place? Maybe just at one space. Maybe it was just at one space. Okay, we've covered everything here. Uh, high pitched bell sounds. Okay, so now you're looking just if what what is abnormal, what seems like um, something that should bother you. And if you can't recognize abnormal, yeah, it doesn't matter. You had your Google and your everything with you, so you could at least try and find out. And that was the point of the exam, to see if you can use the knowledge to actually get to the right conclusions. I guess a high-pitched bell sounds, that's normally to do with obstructions or very hard stools making problems for us. So you have to start worrying now about the constipation heading for an obstruction. Okay, there is nothing serious there. Um, blood pressure, well, I was beneath normal. It's all, it's very difficult to have low blood pressure. So low blood pressure would be something like 90 over 60, maybe 50 to 60. That will be low blood pressure, for example. Does it matter? Yes and no. So it really depends if you have symptoms or problems in your day-to-day -day life. If you have a blood pressure of 90 over 50 and you have no signs and symptoms of any problem you have no lightheadedness you have no headaches you have no issues this is not a problem this is actually good then if you have a blood pressure of 90 to 50 and you're experiencing severe loss of balance um, confusion autostatic hypertension when you're standing up becoming or fainting all of those things then we can automate we can we can say that this is actually now clinically relevant this is something that needs to be treated so Depends from person to person. Heart rate slightly high, doesn't really say anything in this case. Respiratory rate very close to normal, doesn't say anything. Temperature normal, doesn't say anything. So, arriving to the diagnosis, gynecomastia, if a virus toxicity. So, I even told you that if a virus is causing this. And some people still left him on if a virus. Uh, oral thrush, constipation. Um, I'm just wondering, no, I didn't say anything else about codeine. Yeah, shocking. Anyways, um, this list was a bit of a mess. The list at the bottom so it was a bit of a mess. And but ideally, what I would have liked is, well, ideally in uh, the next case labs you guys do, is that all the drugs you identify this person should be on, you write them down here. So at the end of the day, when I look at your care plan, I know that what what you have in mind for this patient. What are the drugs that you think are important for this patient? So ideally, this. Filling out this list is very important. But for this test, it was an issue. I wanted to see if you can identify the problems first. And then, laboratory results. Um, fluff, fluff, fluff. I gave you guys a lot of fluff here to work through, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you got very confused with it. That's fine, it's completely fine. Um, seeing these things, if you don't see them regularly, they would probably confuse everyone. So, um, they're not really indicative of anything here. White cell count, not high. It does, means he doesn't have any active infection at the moment. He doesn't have an active infection at the moment. Yeah, he doesn't have any infection at the moment. Oh, no, he does have the, what do you call it? Yeah, the, the oral candidiasis. So the oral candidiasis is not a severe infection. So it might cause some inflammation. It might not. It depends on the white, blood, white cell count. So uh, you wouldn't you don't necessarily just use the white cell count to identify an infection or inflammation. You would use the white cell count with the CRP, with the temperature. So at least systemically, with the white cell count, he didn't, doesn't, doesn't seem like he has an infection. Red cell count, nothing in there. Hemoglobin 17, very normal. Um, we had so many things about the MCV, I thought I would confuse you by putting it in. Normal, doesn't matter. Um, remember, if it's low, it's microcytic. If it's high, it's macrocytic. 
So iron deficiency, B12 or folate deficiency. See? All right. And then fluff, 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 fluff. So a normal B12 makes sense because he has a normal MCV. And then pH normal, 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 normal. Everything is normal. The only thing that was really abnormal here was the creatinine. But it's not really abnormal. It's just higher than it was. So if you look at the trend, it might indicate that we are heading for trouble eventually. It might, but it might also not indicate that. So that's why monitoring is so important. Monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. If you give something, you want to monitor to be sure you're doing the right thing. Okay. Nothing, 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 nothing. Albumin 40, doesn't matter, nothing, 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 nothing. CD4, 98. So what does this mean? So on its own, it doesn't really mean anything. But in tandem with our previous result, it actually tells us a lot. So our previous result was 51. I remember here, yeah, there's a 51 there. And now it's 98. So that's a massive improvement. Massive improvement. And that, it seems small, you think about the normal range. But remember, we won't get to this normal range overnight. It'll take time to get this in this normal range. And it also depends on how effective the drugs are. So the fact that we got basically almost 300, no, we got 300% higher, means that it's definitely working. Our therapy is working. We're achieving what we want to achieve. We have a goal in mind and we're achieving the goal at the moment. Okay. So, what could we have mentioned? Okay, so you could have moved to a Bakavir or you could have stayed on Tenofovir and then you could have said, for example, renal function did decline, have to monitor into the future. That would, be, would have been a nice one. Or you said renal function did decline, that's why we are advocating for a Bakavir to stop the decline or to counteract that a possible decline due to Tenofovir. That would have been a nice one. Uh, we could have asked for a viral load to direct therapy as well. So now we have the CD4 count and we see, we did see that uh, our treatment is working. But if we had initial viral load and we had another viral load now to now on this day of assessment, we could have correlated that with the CD4 count as well, we did, which would have given us a clearer picture with the CD4. So the biggest problem here is if a viral. So actually, this should be number one. So this guy is getting gynecomastia. What is gynecomastia? It's the abnormal growth of what you, breast tissue. So men can also get breast tissue and men can also get breast cancer. I don't know if you knew that, but yes, it's a thing. Especially as men get older, they have more and more and more estrogen. The more estrogen they have, the more likely it is for them to start developing breasts. So it's a thing that happens in guys. Also, it happens in young children. Year 14, 15, 16 year old, um, a lot of the boys start getting these very tender nipples and that's because their testosterone is being converted via aromatase to aromatase to estrogen so it really is a thing that happens uh, and in children they i think they mock each other in school and call it stonies but it's it's basically their nipple becoming more and more sensitive and it's also this age where the growth will be stunted because estrogen locks your growth plate locks your growth plates Okay, but that's beyond the point. The point was, if a virus should not be on here, it's causing this idiopathic gynecomastia, we have to remove it, we can go for nevirapine. And then your justification will have just been uh, second line NNRTI, since two, toxicity related to if a virus. And then if you said this, you would have probably had to mention then as well, that you would have to change him to, no, oh, ten off of interest have been not been still fine. There was no issue with ten off of interest have been, you would have left him there. If you change him to a Bakavir, you would have had to change him to Lamuvidine as well, and then the Vyrapine. So you would have to go for almost this, well, a completely new regimen. Okay, mentioned, mentioned, mentioned. And, okay, let's just leave it there. That was the start. Now, he had coding, he had some kind of a coding addiction. So, if you guys told me about you want to give him lactulose, or you want to give him senosinoids, or whatever, doesn't matter. I wouldn't have marked it if you didn't address the cause or even realize that there is a cause of the constipation. So the cause of constipation was codeine. So I hope you guys can remember, codeine is one of the opioids. It acts in the mu kappa and delta receptor. I can't draw kappa. Kappa is a very funky thing to draw. I also can't remember how to draw delta. I think, no. Okay, but there's a mu kappa and delta receptor that codeine actually acts upon. And one of these receptors are, is located within the gastrointestinal tract and it causes delayed contractions or delayed gastrointestinal motility. So if a person uses codeine, he might he gets addicted to it in the first case. And then as he gets addicted to it, 
he starts losing the effect of coding so the euphoric effect that you get from coding starts diminishing you get less and less and less of the euphoric effect but you don't develop resistance towards the constipation caused by coding so that's important to know the more you use coding the more constipated you'll get and eventually you might end up with a mega toxic toxic mega toxic mega colon yes okay so i would wonder if you to just mentioned here that you would uh, advise him not to use it or you would uh, you would refer him to a uh, psychiatrist or however i would want to just to see that you guys thought about it so but if you did see the codeine and you went for lactulose amazing so if you mentioned lactulose or sinusinoids and you followed the guideline uh, i would have been very happy with you now all of the opportunistic infections the, the priority of these are probably much higher they would probably rank around here number two number one would have been definitely the epivirins number two would have been all of the rest so what did we need to cover against so cd4 count is lower than 200 so we need to cover against tb so we need isoniazid you need 300 milligrams daily and you have to continue with this until the cd4 count is above 200 that's the first one then you needed something to counteract the possible pcp so that's cotramoxazole 960 milligrams daily okay and then you would have needed something to counteract against the possibility of a recurrence of cryptical cold meningitis so um, i did make a little bit of a mistake here in your case lab you don't necessarily have to use fluconazole straight through to prevent cryptical cold meningitis but if you had cryptical cold meningitis you need to continue using fluconazole 12 months after the fact to prevent another occurrence so here we wrote down that he was admitted for cryptococcal meningitis and so one of the RPs definitely is to get him back on fluconazole he should have been on fluconazole the whole time why did he stop taking it he still needs to be on fluconazole for 12 months after that initial admi admission so only the next year february he'll be taken off of fluconazole and then fluconazole is a nice thing to use in this case because if you use fluconazole you automatically address the oral candidiasis as well and the oral candidiasis actually getting it makes a lot of sense because the cd4 count is still low yes for the p is going much better his cd4 count did increase 300 percent but it's still low he is still at risk for all of these opportunistic infections so if you gave him fluconazole you would have addressed two of the issues two drps or two possible drps you could have mentioned um, okay, that's not important now. And then if you said you want to give the person nice status for the oral candidiasis, I would have been fine with it as well. Um, this is not all of the DRPs. There are more DRPs that you can make if you have the right justification. Um, but I want to give you an idea of how many things there was to actually mention. Oh, for example, another thing is our paradoxin. If you say to counteract peripheral neuropathy caused by isoniazid, you want to use paradoxin, we've given you the mark. Um, and yes, that's a good start. Okay, so I gave you guys much, much, much more uh, possible marks than I actually marked at the end of the day. You only need to get to about 10 here. I think there was 20 to give you an idea. So you guys, you, I marked until 10 for you, but they were, was probably closer to 20 at the time. And then, um, go to therapy, respiration of normal bowel movements, going to the toilet once or twice a week, leaving constipation, um, something like that would have been fine. Anything in that line. If you said normal bowel function, a normal, uh, going to the toilets in this in, in a more regular pattern, etc. Anything in that line, I would have been happy with it. Uh, effective prophylaxis against TB, PCP, critical cause. So a lot of you guys then here wrote prevention of TB. Prevention of TB is prophylaxis. That's the same meaning. So why did you write that? So what I wanted you to write here, measurable endpoint, or how do we know we're achieving? Our goal here is simply not getting TV, not getting PCP. So no signs, no symptoms, no occurrence of it. So we know we're preventing it, but now we want to see if we're not, we're not getting it. That is how we measure if we're achieving the prophylactic, our goal of preventing it. Um, kind of education for the patient. So anything adherence, anything education. Uh, anything you wanted to tell him about opportunistic infections, anything you wanted to tell him about safe sex, all of those things I gave marks for. There's probably a lot of extra things you got to ask of right written here. Yeah. I read through all of the things you wrote. So, oh, and of course, codeine. If you didn't mention codeine, yeah, you would have lost half a mark. So this would have been you could have gotten, got a maximum of one and a half out of two if you didn't mention codeine. So you got penalized again for codeine. 
Uh, and then isonize it, effective monitoring, no signs and symptoms of TB. Safety monitoring, we already spoke about it a million times. ALT, AST, signs of peripheral neuropathy, definitely very easy. So in this case, you should have chosen one. And this is actually just a free mark. Both of them are correct. It's not like one is not correct. It's just a free mark I gave you guys. Once again, too lenient. And then effectiveness, viral load going down, CD4 going up. That's how you know that the drug is working. All right, and then um, I, I just basically wanted to wanted to see if you know a buck of it, hypersensitivity, most important. Then of it, most important is serum creatinine. So if you gave enough of it, you would have scratched out this. If you gave a buck of it, you would have no. Yeah, if you have a buck of it, you'd have scratched out that or anything of the sorts. Uh, this is your. This is a very loaded one. I mean, I gave you the answer for this one here. This, I mean, I made the way too easy. Um, no, no PCP. No signs and symptoms of PCP. Signs plus symptoms. All right. Um, serum creatinine very important. Actually, another thing that's important here is anemia. So, uh, if a person goes to a global level of about six, cytochrome is contraindicated. Okay, and then yeah, I'm not gonna go into all of it, but. Uh, what are the things we could have used? So we had to go for nevirapine. The uh, did we mention anything about isonide? Yeah, we did. Did we mention anything about fluconazole? No, we didn't. Did we mention anything about... Hmm, what else can we mention here? Actually... So it probably depends on what you use in the first case. So if you change your therapy... Mm, no. Fluconazole... Mm. A lot of you did nice tested here. Okay, so it'll depend on what kind of what kind of grouping you're going through. Cotramoxazole, did you do it? Cotramoxazole? Oh, we did do cotramoxazole there. Uh, you said pyridoxine. Mm. Mm. Let's see what else we did put on here. Uh, we did mention lactulose, the fluconazole, osmosis, TB. Bacavar, lamuvidine, kilos, ABBC, and lamuvidine. Okay, so it would have dependent, uh, would have been dependent on what you chose as your therapy. So if you didn't end up with enough here, you probably didn't treat everything you needed to treat in this patient. So what I did here is, I simply marked all the facts. So if you said nevirapine here, you would have needed to say viral load in CD4 here. And you would have mentioned to say, uh, and you would have needed to say ALT plus AST and absence of sensitivity rash. Something like that, for example. Nice tacit, um, clearing of oral plague, or reversal or eradication of oral candidiasis. And then you should have said something like, no routine monitoring required. If there's no monitoring required, then make up something. A lot of you guys made up something. Nausea and vomiting. If I see nausea and vomiting, I'm just like, don't write nausea and vomiting. Okay, and then... Uh, pyridoxine, also no routine monitoring required, absence of peripheral neuropathy here, uh, abacavir, same story as the rest, and uh, then your hypersensitivity reaction this side, etc, etc, etc. So, I hope you understand how to answer this question next time, or how to answer something like this next time. Okay, and I would definitely make it more difficult in the future. Okay, that's the first video of a few to come. Maybe not today, but they will come. Good luck.